Well, good morning, everybody. Um, Happy New Year. What more can I say? Um, I think I just say to everybody, I hope it's better than last one. Maybe that's a good positive thought for the day. What are we talking about today? Three things. We're hearing about sustainability. We're hearing about how clients actually really care whether your business is sustainable or not. It's not an internal issue. ESG is a term that you'll hear quite a lot today. Strategy. We're under the, one of the leading strategists for the sector, Andrew Headley, with us. But what does strategy really mean? Is it just another word for planning or is it a little bit more to it than that? And delighted that Paloma from Be The Business, who heads up their management and leadership programs, is coming to talk a bit about. I've used the word learning as a one word. I know it's much more complex than that, but at least I think that's the key issue, that it's about knowledge sharing in different ways. So those are our three themes. So let's just go through who's who's on the panel today. Firstly, Andrew Headley. Andrew, as I mentioned, is the founder and CEO of Headley Consulting. He's also, and this will come up later, the chair of judges for our Managing Partners Forum Awards. Now, that is now in the 19th iteration. So we've been running it for about 20 years and we just go live actually next week. So that's very exciting. And what a fantastic year to measure management's performance. I mean, I have this very simple expression, BC, standing for before before COVID. Um, I know it's probably blasphemous, excuse me, but I think it really has the world of management and management's contribution to the business fundamentally shifted over the past 12 months. And then we wanna have really find some excellent examples. Julia Hayho, Julia. Founder and CEO of Hayho Consulting, formerly the Chief Strategy Officer for Baker and McKenzie, which, as most of you will know, sorry, Baker McKenzie, my apologies, and they are a major global law firm. So very much bringing that really inter- international perspective. Uh, Paloma Sackman, um, she is the head of leadership and management programs at Be the Business. Now, for those of you who don't know the Be the Business, it's a really fantastic organisation, a charity that really helps, particularly the firms that really want to do better. And there are lots of firms that are really reviewing their management structures and their way approach to business at the moment and be the business are amazing resource so if you're not familiar with them particularly their rebuild program really worth looking into in a bit more depth and what more can i say my anchor tenant francesca welcome francesca um global leader for network capabilities the point person always brings a a ray of sunshine to this program and delighted to have you with you for if this is the 35th i think this is your 34th appearance so that has to be a record in itself so amazing thank you so much and me Yours truly, the founder and chief exec of the Managing Partners Forum. And Managing Partners Forum, (coughs) looking back over the last year, I think a lot of people have felt we probably made a big effort to stay relevant to our members. So I think this panel is one of the things that we do. But there's actually a few more other things that we do. But we'll talk about those in a minute. So first of all, let's just run through seven strategies for retuning your firm. Now, what's retuning about? Well, it's about saying, well, when it's a tough time, you don't just cover your car with a tarpaulin. What you actually do is you think about how you can get ready for the race when it resumes, because if not, you'll be back on the racetrack and whether it's the car, or whether it's the driver, or whether it's the pit team, or whether it's your failure to catch up to date with what the other cars are up to, you will fall behind, you may even crash. So be careful. So how can you go about retuning? Well, here's six, seven things rather, I think are really helpful just to kind of keep in mind as you go along. A big strategic plan, if you like. So think big. Uh, there's Lewis Carroll great saying about how have you believed six impossible things before breakfast? Have you done that today? Who knows? But you've got to think big, but also think small, because if you're not focusing on the angles that resonate with your key audiences, you are not going to be able to achieve your objectives. That's So keep those two in balance. Remember that you are the power of your relationships, particularly in the service businesses. But relationships are fundamentally around reciprocity. You can't just run an address book and say, oh, that's my relationships. It doesn't work that way. You've got to think about how you can do the win-win with them. Finally, or not finally, sorry, but do a campaign. Think about, we're now 35, issue, 35 episodes. That's getting to be a campaign. Because what it's doing is creating an audience into a community. We've had people who have been on this, watch this show 20 times plus. Amazing. Thank you so much for keep staying with us. What's next? Well, two jump there. I don't know why I did that. Never mind. Uh, Drop convention, go for new ideas, go for new services. You've got to think of new things. Paloma was mentioning minutes ago about uh, somebody who supplied schools. Well, guess what? The schools are closed. So what are they going to do with that business? Moving on. Speed is of the essence. Uh, I think we all kind of know that. But if you've got, and this goes back to Lean Start, you've got to really think about when you go to market, you're actually, what you're doing is you're market testing your assumptions. Uh, accountants love assumptions we can change profit numbers so easily if we change the policy accounting policies otherwise known as the assumptions but actually in any walk of life 
what is it what are the assumptions that underlie whatever it is you're looking to do and articulate them make them clear share them internally and if they prove invalid and they will because all scientists will tell you that most experiments fail it's nothing unusual then you have to amend the assumptions and then keyword pivot in a new direction it's called lean start and it's it's an approach which i think has really uh, showed a lot of merit in the current climate lastly be entrepreneurial and that really has two parts to me, keep listening and keep innovating. And as I say, every time we run this show, the key word in that sentence is listening. If you're not listening to your market, if you're not listening to your people, you will be suboptimal in whatever you seek to do. It's inevitable, you can't really change that unless you're lucky and fall down a gold mine. Happens for some people, but I wouldn't bet on it as a strategy. And that's adopted from Elena Kutsko of Globsec in Bratislava, speaking back in April, 2020. So a very prescient lady, thank you for that. So let's talk a little bit about the forum. I said I mentioned we're going to slightly do a little, little changes this time. Firstly, there's some things coming up which I would really encourage you to think about participating in. Um, we've got Kate Wilson home from PwC on Tuesday talking a bit about financial performance. That's the law firm management. And again, please sign up. You can see the link at the bottom. And if not, it's on the website, npfglobal.com. And the following week, the strategy group is looking at the whole area of data standards. So there's so a couple of things coming up there. And we'll be looking about what future things are next week as well when we come to that. The big one, I also mentioned already with Andrew, but the awards, where they were going live at the moment, and there's a launch reception on Tuesday, as it happens, which please come along. And that's really for the people, I call them the unsung heroes, but they're the people who actually have to put together the entries and never, ever get an invitation to the ceremony. Uh, and it's life. I know marketing people kind of accept that, but that's the world we live in. So it's all about showing your contribution to the business in a pandemic year. And that's been very, very important, I think. Lastly, uh, just to pick it up here, because otherwise if it's a threat at the end, you won't probably be aware of it. But we've we've st we've now brought all the five minute slots that we've been having over the year or so over since March into, uh, again, on the website. And you can go in by keyword, you can go in by presenter. And also on top of that, we've also put something in with all the sessions from our uh, North Shore Summit from December, which was a really great event with some we had cabinet office in there, Northern Powerhouse, some amazing people, really good sessions. So if you want to watch that, if you've got a spare little bit of time, then that's there as well. So that's basically some of the things that the forum's up to. So I thought that might be useful just to share. Whoa, how does that look like? Well, this is the new one. This is going to be our big, big gig looking into 2021. And I'm just going to say at this stage that it's about fast track innovation, which is a new term which I came up with, but it's fundamentally around design sprints. There's a collaborative design playbook that we've developed on this project we've been working on for two years. And there's a flagship conference on the 16th and 17th of March, and I'll drop you all an invitation to that. But that's all I'm going to say at the moment, just a little bit of a quick uh, catch up as to something new coming along. And whoa, that's a bit different from the usual black, isn't it, Richard? So let's talk about the day job, as they said. So back to the polls. As we all know, one of the great things about this show is that we run polls. And those polls aren't just for us as the audience. They're also for the sector and for government. And this quote is verbatim from government at, um, last year. Uh, your polls are incredibly valuable in analysis. Um, one, one week I got them a day late to government. So they asked me where they were. I think that's my definition of thought leadership. So that's great. So please participate in a minute or two. But let's just look back because actually it's not just the, the government. The House of Lords did a really interesting um, so, um, report back in October and our poll, one of our polls was the only bit of evidence that was used that wasn't sourced from government in that particular uh, report. And it was a hundred page report. So, you know, they are getting a lot of traction. So please, please contribute because if you don't contribute, it clearly doesn't work. So let's have a look. What this was, a, this was a month ago and we did the monthly tracker and I wanted to try and find out this is, goes back to April now. What was the level of dip in your firm's income over the next 12 months? And what's fascinating <coughs> is if you track the one at the top, the purple, 30% or more, there is a massive group of firms going back. More than half the firms back in April were thinking that they would lose a more than 30% of their income. Current number is probably about seven. Uh, that has been the big, big shift, I think, over the past year. It'll be really interesting to see when I come to ask you to uh, do it again in a minute as to what you what you guys see as the current situation. In terms of activity, very interesting. I was thinking this was a sort of the the tongs for the, the, the barbecue so you don't drop the sausage. And that worked fine up to about August. But after that, it got a bit more difficult. But but as you can see, what's happening here is that the <coughs> the blue one, which is the expansion, 
Uh, Boris bounced back in February, if we all remember what that was. And all of a sudden now, it's very much below the red line until December, until the end of, that was done on the 27th of November, that particular one, the last time we ran this show. So we're going to run it again today. Let's just see. So that's the level of activity. New, new work, very much a similar pattern, although on the whole, people said, oh, new work's going to be difficult, but they've kind of done a workaround. So the new work's coming in still, I think that's fairly clear. Headcount, now that was, again, showed a dramatic change towards the end of November compared with all the previous months. So what's going on there? So let's just find out on that one as well. So that takes us to, to today's poll. And uh, <clears throat> for those of you who haven't done it before, it's anonymous. So you can reassure that nobody's going to be aware of who you are. I'm going to allow five minutes, and it does take about five minutes to do this one. And if you haven't used it before, you need to scroll down the box to see the questions because they come one after another. Uh, key point, if I'm asking for three answers, please don't give me five, because otherwise I'm afraid your response will go into the pit once I have to do the analysis for government. Of course, it will appear today when we give you the instant feedback, but unfortunately it won't actually figure in the information that we can then share with others because we basically <coughs> make sure that it is done to a rigorous standard. So what's it covering? Some of the things we just looked at, but some other things as well. So the business priorities and the barriers, what's being discussed at management meetings, what's happening with your firm's income activity, the headcount. Um, what about the general mood towards returning to the office? Um, that's going to happen at some stage, we think, to what extent. And obviously the future office space requirements, which again is something which I think will be uh, of interest to the property people, because certainly I've been reading stuff recently about law firms going for maybe half the volume of space that they previously needed. I think that might be a bit extreme, but hey, you can't always tell. So there are two uh, areas which are marked in red. I assume you can see which are the ones which are the most, the top priorities. Um, Andrew will please, be pleased to see develop a clear purpose and strategy is up there. Um, and also, and again, this is playing, I think, to Paloma's agenda, developing people's skills and capabilities because a huge amount of training aims to achieve that precise objective. So, so that's really interesting. So those are the two top priorities. Um, others which have been important through the usual operational efficiency is always up there. That's pretty close. And uh, the other one that you typically find is <clears throat> something to do with the use of technology, which again comes in. So, th so those are the sort of, uh, those are the, the key priorities. Um, what are we doing about the level of dip in the next year? Well, 62% are saying none. So there you go. So that trend that I showed you is very much shifting into almost, well, that's less than 7%. I mean, that's getting back to, to balance. So, so I think people are saying now we, that we can look, we can put 2020 behind us, looking into the next 12 months, we're pretty confident that we're not going to see much of a dip, which is great. Um, because that's good news for the people who we employ. It's good for you for our client because we can serve them, et cetera. In terms of expanding and tracting activity, modest expansion, two thirds of you, uh, significant expansion, six, 70% so of you are looking at some expansion. And if you're looking at new work, very much the same sort of numbers emerging. And on headcount, um, <clears throat> not quite as much, but 50, over 50% 50 are looking to expand their headcount, which given the high levels of unemployment we have at the moment, that's quite good news, I think. What about working from home? And this has always been an interesting one. Well, 2% think that everybody will be back in the office after the pandemic is eased. I know we're in the next lockdown, but at some point there will be the end of the pandemic. I think that's a reasonable working assumption. I wouldn't want to put money on when. Um, everybody uh, working from home are always around right about the 20% mark. And then um, interestingly, I think there's been a shift slightly between half and three quarters, but they're the big ones, obviously, as you'd expect. What about the office space requirements? Fundamentally about the same, but nobody's going for more. That won't surprise you, but less. Yeah, there's still a group that are going for more, less than 30, but mostly it's about the same. Now, whether that's because the idea before that everybody could be crammed into less and less space is no longer the way things are going to work in the future. I don't know. That's something we'll just have to, to work out. But um, certainly there isn't perhaps the same knee jerk. We're going to have a massive amount less space needed. What, whatever you might read in the newspaper headlines, this is a, a say, mid market group, which is possibly different from the ones that the journalists always talk to. So, one of the things that are holding you back absolutely massive here is to do with the financial health of the client base, which I don't think I would have included as an, op as an even as an option a year ago, the idea that our clients will have financial problems. But 
that's a reality and that is the thing that is holding you back from optimal performance as a and that's by a fair amount of way and then the poor economic outlook comes in as a sort of a second uh so those are the two big drivers that hasn't changed from last time around although i think the financial health has become even more apparent now that we're into the next lockdown and we know that some businesses that were kind of wobbly before are now really going to be struggling uh what's driving the discussions amongst the partner directors finance and cash flow uh followed pretty much by marketing and that's interesting for those of you who haven't been seeing these stats before because of course the idea that marketing could come ahead of client service is be anathema to certain people but that's the way it is um and uh, operational performance again was quite high is falling back but it's basically there are firms that talk about the money and there are firms that talk about winning new work and that's fundamentally those two firms and let's see which one again this is a key strategic issue i'm sure andrew will have views on this and lastly how are we faring well not too bad uh, we had andrew kakabadzi on the show uh, a few weeks ago and who's a, obviously an amazing prof at henley and covers leadership and governance and he was saying he tracks about fourteen thousand boards biggest board survey in the world and he was saying, well, most boards, if they were getting that sort of rating from the people that they employed, they would be very, very happy. So, you know, 83 percent are leaders are accessible, 75 percent employees are valued as high as other stakeholders. Uh, people are sharing strategic options, 60 percent. Um, pain is being shared equally. That's maybe 50. Uh, transparency, 65. And none of the statements are true, 4 percent. I mean, that is a very positive um, endorsement of the leadership of this sector, which is sort of why I guess we continue to be the largest and many would argue the most successful sector in the country, uh, COVID and Brexit notwithstanding. So anyway, that's my kind of quick run through the results. Thank you very much, everybody on the call today, on the show today for, for sharing. I'd now like to introduce you to Andrew Headley, who's going to take you through his thoughts on where we're at. And most importantly, what are the key issues in strategy that he thinks we should be covering? Thank you, Richard, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm in my strict five-minute deadline, so I've got my clock here that I'm, I'm looking at. Um, yeah, it, I mean, what a year. What a year it's been. And I suppose uh, in terms of strategy, what are the implications for, for, for the longer-term future, the strategic direction of, of our firms? And I guess the metaphor um, I, I'm using to describe this is rather like an ice sculpture where, you know, we had a, quite a rigid structure and many firms, a rigid strategy, a rigid approach that things have melted. Everything's very fluid now. You know, we can do things that would have taken an age to do historically, but which happen overnight nowadays. So I think in many respects, firms have surprised themselves in their ability to be agile and their ability, you know, to make necessity the mother of invention. However, at some point, the ice will refreeze. I suppose my, my challenge to you as leaders is when it, re when it refreezes, let's make sure it refreezes into the shape we want it to be rather than the shape it once was. Um, now, you know, Churchill once famously said, you know, never, never waste a good crisis. And I think, you know, the pandemic's provided a great opportunity to bring around so lots of positive change. Um, when we think about strategy, you know, what strategy at its core is about is the, the allocation of scarce resources to create uh, that sustainable competitive advantage. But also what it's about is the ability to affect change. Uh, and again, you know, over the years, I've come across many firms with wonderful stories, wonderful, in many respects, fairy stories that they call their strategy, but not really rooted in the ability to bring about change and the ability to deliver based on their competencies or, the, or their ability to acquire those competencies. And fundamentally, change is about leadership and it's about that's about the people on this call so what what do we as leaders do to to shape and then deliver the, st the strategies of our organizations two or three things just to mention um i'm a big believer in logical incrementalism as a as a, as a school of thought and what, what that's really about is being really clear about what we want to get to but by being quite flexible about the means um and taking things in small incremental steps and after each step assessing where we got to, is our ultimate goal still the same and making decisions in a much more dynamic way. Um, I found that really useful in working with law firms in particular or partnerships in general, where partners tend to be quite risk averse uh, and tend not to like big leaps into the unknown, but will accept small change. It's also a fantastic approach in very fast moving dynamic markets. So, so for me, that incrementalist approach 
you know, has a lot of a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, leverage in this sort of world. Uh, it's also an approach which allows us to test and to fail fast and to try things. Uh, and again, you know, we hate failure, don't we? But the reality is, you know, in this fast moving market, we need to be prepared to experiment strategically and tactically in order to, to find what works in, in a new paradigm. Um, leading into that, I guess, is the, uh, is the thought of, you know, how do we possibly uh, understand where to invest? How do we possibly understand how to shape strategy in a world which is increasingly unpredictable, in a world that we cannot possibly foresee? Um, my metaphor here, if you like, is uh, let's think about this in a sporting context. If you're the coach of a team uh, and, and you're told there's a new game being invented, uh, the rules are being written, there are no rules yet, and we only really know three things. We know it will involve a team of players. We know it will, be, it will take place on a piece of grass, uh, and we know it, it, will, it will involve a ball. The rules won't be published for six months, but your first competitive game will take place two weeks later. What, what do we do? Well, we could sit and wait for the rules and do nothing. That might not be the wisest move. What we probably do is find ways uh, to identify the skills and competencies we need in order to compete. So that might be stamina. It might be agility. It might be hand-eye coordination. It will be communication. We focus on the core competencies. And then when we learn the rules of the game, we tune those competencies into the specific rule set in order to compete. So, you know, seeing on the, on, the, on the survey just there, the importance of training, the importance of people development, I'm really heartened by that because I think that really lies at the core of, uh, of successful strategy. Um, I'd also say, you know, as leaders, you know, we lead through, va our, through our values, through our behaviours and through our bias for action. Uh, and our people are watching us. They're watching us in terms of how we, how we communicate and implement strategy around our organisations. Um, I end with just with one thought, which is, you know, it's said there are three types of organization in the future. You know, those that make things happen, those that watch things happen, and those that wonder what happened. So I guess as leaders, let's make sure we're in the first group, not the third. That's my, my five minutes, Richard, hopefully with some thoughts that we can discuss later. Fantastic. Uh, Julia, come and tell us a little bit about uh, sustainability and the importance that is to clients, but please pick up the strategy issues if that's of interest too. Okay, thank you. Um, so professional advisors have really got a pivotal role to play in helping clients with their sustainable business transformation. But it is a dynamic area, um, as uh, we've just been talking about, and it can be hard to know where best to start and how to approach this. So I'm glad today to share some findings from my recent um, board and general counsel interviews that I've been conducting. And also what I deduce as the three key ways that firms can approach this important task. So over the last year, I've been conducting a series of board interviews with the World Economic Forum on the future of the corporation and stakeholder governance. Um, that's with my former firm, Baker McKenzie. And then in parallel, I've been conducting some general counsel interviews on why sustainability matters to them. So I've got an interesting sort of compare and contrast. But this research has clearly shown that environmental social governance, ESG, is now top of both board and in the case of law firms, general counsel's agendas. And that's particularly because of the focus on brand reputation, the search for growth that we've been hearing about, and also mitigating risk, risks. And I think um, Unilever often held out um, as a real beacon in this area. And I quite like Alan Jupe's recent comment that he made. There's a very strong business case, which simply put, is where our brands compete on a platform that is purposeful, whether it's a sustainable environmental proposition or a social benefit, these brands are growing at roughly twice the rate of the rest of our portfolio. And our portfolio is now about 60% of what we would call purpose-led brands. Yet interestingly, the research I've been doing shows that firms are yet to approach clients in the way that they're looking for, which is they're looking for a more strategic, a more client-centric, the listening point, and a coordinated manner. And so I'm going to suggest today that there's three key issues to tackle to be able to do this well. First of all, really get to grips with the board's sustainability agenda. Not all businesses are at the same place on ESG. 
Some have fully embraced what we would know as stakeholder capitalism. So for them, the purpose of the company, their business, is to serve the interests of all their material stakeholders for longer term value creation, rather than more of a shorter term focus on maximizing shareholder returns. And I just mentioned Unilever as an example. They have sustainability embedded in their DNA and they have their compass, which really acts as their guiding light. But even they will say it's a work in progress. But importantly, there's a lot of new businesses that firms can really help. Um, businesses like Habito, the new digital mortgage online provider, and it has sustainability enshrined in its B Corp structure. So B Corps are really interesting. They're growing rapidly. There's now three and a half thousand of them around the world, large and small businesses. But businesses and sectors are at different places on sustainability and ESG. So it's important, first of all, in your work to get to grips with their strategic board agenda. And from that, you can work out where their most material ESG opportunities and risks and what their sort of tone is all about. So don't lead with your solutions. Start with the client. The second area that came out really clearly in my research is it's important to understand the client's stakeholder landscape afresh. So look at this afresh. Now, businesses have typically uh, looked at stakeholders in terms of those that are in direct line of their site. So obviously their customers, their employees, investors, shareholders. But what they haven't done, and many are now admitting this, is they've been less effective at looking at these stakeholder groups and looking into these stakeholder groups for voices less heard, typically minorities, or more distant voices, so future generations or within their supply chains. And this has been brought to fore, as we all know, through the Black Lives Matter movement and also climate change movement. And particularly now investors, we're all seeing a much greater rise of investor activism, particularly on governance. And this is at a time when investors are really key to helping finance the transition for businesses. So do look at your client's stakeholder landscape afresh to know where the dynamics are and how you can best help them. The third area is think about ESG in a cohesive, rounded way. Now, businesses haven't always approached ESG in a rounded way, but this is changing um, and it's needed. So if we take, say, the energy sector as an example, we've seen great progress on the E, particularly with the widespread shift to um, renewable energy. But question within the energy, within the mining industries, there's obviously been a lot less focus on the S. Have they really taken on board the reputational financial risks of failing to understand the communities, the new communities in which they operate? Governance as well is coming to the fore, the G, and traditionally that's all been around board composition, compensation, competencies. But I believe we're going to see a much bigger focus on the stakeholders, the who and the how. So firms do need to consider ESG in more cohesive way with their service lines and think about broader capabilities adjacent to their core capabilities that they may need to include and how they can best fill those gaps, whether it's organically, acquisitions, alliances. So in concluding, I hope you find this little whistle-stop tour of the research interesting and the highlights interesting and also the three key ways to help your clients interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. And I'm sure we'll pick up a number of those points in the panel session. So we now turn to our third guest, which is, uh, who is Polona Sackman. Polona, as I mentioned, is the head of leadership and management programs for Be The Business, which covers all sectors, not just ours. And I thought it'd be really interesting to hear a bit from her around, well, what are, what are the things that are going on in the clients? What are the things that these clients that really want to make progress? What's interesting to them? Because if nothing else, that's a really good agenda when you are going to talk to your client, because the chances are that they probably have tackling exactly this some issues. So over to you, Paloma. Um, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Richard. And, and thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I realise I'm in a slightly different position to Andrew and Julia. Um, but it's a real pleasure to be here. One, because I'm hoping I can tell you a little bit about things that can help you as individuals, as business leaders in your own right. Two, something that could potentially help the leadership in your firms invest in. And we've already mentioned today developing people's skills and capabilities being top of your agenda. And thirdly, and I think this is probably the most interesting, is how you can help your clients improve their performance and 
their loyalty and investment in their firms. Um, so just to kind of pick up really quickly context, because we're still relatively new, um, I work for an organisation called We Business. We are an independent charity um, that is supported by government, but which really has the business community at the heart of our work. We are by business, for business, and everything that we do and produce um, for small business owners is really given knowledge from expert business leaders already working out in the field. And our mission is really to inspire and support small and medium business owners and managers like yourselves and the ones that you work with day in and day out to improve your performance and your productivity. So we're not asking anyone to kind of grow exponentially. We're just asking everyone to make what Richard talked about earlier on, small improvements to improve the way that they run them first, because those small changes can really add up to big, significant ones. And Andrew also talked to that earlier. Um, I thought I'd share with you um, just a, a stat um, from the business support survey that we very recently ran at the end of the last year. It's a survey that we've run with um, 1,500 um, small and medium-sized firms from all sectors and based all over the country. And what you might be surprised to hear, but is kind of reassuring, and I guess is one of the reasons why I'm here talking to you today, is that accountants are the number one place where owners of businesses, smaller businesses, go for strategic advice. And when I'm talking about strategic advice, I'm talking about advice on financing and advice on how to grow and make their businesses more profitable. Um, and you'll also find on the camp of people that they go to looking for that strategic advice, um, lawyers and other professional services that um, these firms turn to. And what we've seen during COVID is that business leaders have turned more and more for seeking um, seeking support and seeking advice to help them navigate these monstrous times. And you know, whether they're in a strong position or a poor position, they've needed that help um, on how to do that. So I thought that would be quite an interesting um, set to share with you that that's kind of still standing strong and something um, which just demonstrates how important it is that you are equipped with the best information in order to help these firms navigate to the support that they need. Um, so at the business, we're focused on two main areas, and the one that I'm going to focus on today is really about investing in increasing leadership and management capabilities. And I think that's why Richard referred to us as a, a learning um, element of what we're talking about today. Um, and there are a few things that I wanted to tell you about programs that we run that are available up and down the country that may be of interest to you may be interested to people in your firms or may be interested um, to your clients and you may want to tell them about them. Um, and these are things that you may want to participate in from something that you benefit from or it may be something that you actually want to give back into and we've seen that uh, during the pandemic that professionals have really wanted to give their expertise and help SMEs um, stage a fight back um, against the virus. And so, you know, with Brexit now, fully in action, how do they navigate that as well? Um, so one, we have a mentoring program. This is where we match leaders from small to medium businesses with experienced business leaders um, for some of the biggest firms in the country. So the likes of GSK, BA Systems, McKinsey, these are all people who are giving up their time and their expertise and want to support these business leaders. And I'm sure there are many of you on this call that have had a mentor and have really benefited from it. Um, and I, I just want to read um, you today because I, I wish I could have brought some of the smaller business owners that I work with today along with me. But I, I have a quote um, from one uh, lady called called Liz Smith, who said after her relationship, which was a 12-month relationship, she said it was a massive positive um, and they had their best year for over a decade after having a mentor. Um, and they achieved last year's turnover in 11 months and have made a profit for that year. So that just shows what support 
um, confidence and having an external, external sounding board can really give a firm. Um, so we have two types of programs within mentoring. We have a 12 month program where you get specially matched with a mentor. Um, you meet with that mentor um, roughly every month. Now it's in a way it's easier. It happens online. So you don't need to move anywhere. Um, and that person is really a sounding board for that business leader. So that might be something that you want to participate in as in you might want a mentor yourself or you actually might want to be a mentor. And the great thing about that is that it's a great way to develop your own leadership skills and also learn about um, different small business owners and how they run their businesses. The second thing that we spun up during COVID is a rapid response mentoring program. So this is a kind of a shorter, sharper program. It's three months long because we know that there are businesses that need help right now on specific problems. And again, people here are looking for real expertise. So if you have um, time and expertise that you think you can lend to this program, um, it's another great program um, that is really interesting. And we're currently running a program in collaboration with NatWest where we're focusing on female entrepreneurs. Um, so you, again, if you're interested in that, it's a fantastic program. The next program that I wanted to tell you about, which is probably one that is very close to my heart uh, because I started it at Be The Business, um, but also I participate in one of them, is our advisory boards. You will know, as well as I do, that many small business owners do not have boards in their firms and could really benefit from getting external advice. Um, and so what we thought is, well, what if we could set up advisory boards which are not official but they basically act um, as a group of supportive leaders um, so they're made up of five experienced business leaders that work with a small business owner for a period of a year they meet once a quarter and again they act as a sounding board so it's almost mentoring on supercharge you get four people or five people in the room at the same time but they work with you over a course of a year and Richard mentioned this firm before they're called Dunster's Farm they're food wholesaler and they provide um, food into um, largely schools but now they have a consumer business as well as a result of COVID um, and I've been, had the pleasure of working with them over the last year and it's been tremendous to see them grow as a business they're a family business now run by a brother and sister and to see them grow look at how they might adopt technology what questions they should be asking themselves and now through the pandemic how they've redesigned and restructured their team to make sure they can support the two revenue streams they have b2b and b2c and it's been a great experience for them and for the people sitting on the board to get to know that business so we're always looking for advisors who are keen to those boards is a great way to build your network but we're also looking for firms who want to take advantage of this unique opportunity so again if you want to send many of your clients our way it's free um, and it's a it's a great opportunity and the last program i want to mention is um productivity through people it's a 10-month executive educational program run out of universities across the uk we're currently live in four universities Bath, Strathclyde, Lancaster and Aston um, and it has a real mixture of the best kind of academia, the best of peer learning and then we've brought in through some of our corporate partners um, site visits and kind of expertise that they can share back into the group. So that's a, a 10 month progress as I said these cohorts are kicking all the time and it's a great opportunity um, to develop leadership skills and really think about how you can drive productivity through your teams. We've talked about people a lot people are critical. So I'm, I'm going to end there, but um, I really hope um, this is something of interest and um, I look forward to following up with some of you. No, oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Paloma. And I think a lot of people are just completely unaware of the extent to which they can help. I mean, we all very focus on surviving in our business, but actually picking up curiously what you were saying a minute ago about how the um, professional firms have been very much in demand by their clients to help them through the pandemic. That's probably the other side of the reason why we haven't seen those big dips in income that we thought were likely to be the case. So Francesca, welcome back. Happy New Year. Um, what are the two or three things that you've heard this morning that really interested and excited you? 
Oh, Happy New Year, Richard, and 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 it's what a joy to be back. I've, I've missed you guys. Um, it's uh, it, it, I, I think it's it's always intriguing when you get to January, and you've had that little bit of reflection time over Christmas. And I think often a lot of businesses are looking at strategy. So how timely to to hear from Andrew and Julia and, and Paloma on different aspects of that. Um, loads stood out for me as it always does. So you get great panelists, Richard. And hey, manager. Um, uh, apart from the fact I love Andrew's background, the, the, the bit about empathy uh, it has been such a strong theme throughout 2020. And you can really see it rolling into 2021. You know, empathy about how people are coping uh, with the rather strange environment we're in. Empathy about how you can take that forward into the future and how that builds into your strategy. And I know we often talk about how difficult it is to take what I would call those those slightly um, softer, but they're not soft in a weak way. They're really strong, but they're less definable items into a strategy. But anyone who's revisiting their strategy at the moment would clearly be wanting to make sure those items are in there. And I love the quote about uh, the firms that perhaps just wonder what on earth happened. And I think quite a few people will be thinking that that's what hit their clients in 20, uh, 2020. Um, I, actually, I'm in the process of working on our global strategy at the moment, which we revisit on a regular basis. And trying to get 129 countries to agree the strategy is quite entertaining. Um, feels a little bit like every partner meeting that anyone's ever been involved in. Uh, but isn't it fascinating how the world has shifted in the sense of it's strategically some things that looked really hard before people are going you know what we can't get hung up on that stuff you can't get too territorial uh, when you're in a world which is so volatile and so changing so so actually in some ways this is the perfect time to make some strategic decisions that might not otherwise uh, get that opportunity so something about seizing the opportunity um two other quick things from me Richard, on the sustainability, which is clearly, if, if that's not sitting in somebody's, in someone's strategic intent, they've, they've clearly missed a trick, uh, a really, really valuable insight around there, of course. And I just want to pick up on the DNI piece of that diversity and inclusion element of sustainability. Sustainability about your business, about how embedded that needs to be. It's change transformation. If it's not embedded, it doesn't happen. And, and also, uh, has there ever been a true example over the last few months about the need to maximize the potential of of everybody to be effective so that really resonated um, and I love what Be The Business are doing Palermo it's great to see you um, and to hear that uh, the advisory boards what a great idea what a great idea I mean we, we spend a lot of our time in our business helping boards because you know that's part of the service we do but for those firms that those businesses that are more embryonic can't afford to do that or actually just want to get a different insight there's something really powerful about getting like-minded people together and getting that um, that constructive uh, criticism that can come in, that constructive feedback. And I think that drives you straight back into the sustainability. If you if you if all you have is your own view or the view of a small number, you become an echo chamber. How can you broaden that out? So um, I thought that was really fascinating. So thank you, Richard, for pulling everybody together. We try, we try. Andrew, we had a question which came in about almost like where do you start? And I know you've kindly sent back a, a note to the person involved, but just want to sort of say if somebody comes to you and say, uh, right, I think I need a strategy. I mean, you as a strategy expert, well, mm. what would your response be to that? I think I think it's, it's a it's a really inter interesting question, Richard. And I guess, you know, within the context of professional service firms, I would also say you start from where you are uh, in the sense that, you know, Francesca referenced there, the challenge of, of herding the cats, the challenge of taking a partnership on, on a journey with you. So, so, so typically I'll be looking at understanding probably three, three, three dimensions, you know, your, your external dimension, your clients and your markets, um, the, your, your, your capabilities and competencies, but also probably the most challenging question discussion in all of these, all of the, all of these sort of strategy processes rests on the what sort of firm do you want to be? And really getting a strong consensus across the partnership about the sort of firm we aspire to be, but also the sort of firm we, we, we can be in terms of a stretch objective that is stretching but is achievable. Um, I, 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 do, I do find it uh, really fascinating, you know, in, in having those sorts of moderated discussions around the leadership team to land on the consensus. What I'd also say, I, I always do say, is let's not con confuse consensus with unanimity. unanimity. You know, we're not going to get to the point necessarily where everyone agrees on on the direction of travel. But hopefully we'll get to the point where even those who don't agree with it personally can see that it's the it's the right thing for the business to do. 
So yes, yeah, so, so, so the starting point for me is you know, some, some really good understanding of, of our, ourselves and our competency capabilities, really good understanding of the markets in which we in which you operate, uh, but most importantly, having a proper grown-up discussion around the sort of firm we, asp we aspire to be. Because um, ultimately, it's about alignment, isn't it? And about getting people on the same page, pointing in the same direction, hopefully rowing in unison, rather than uh, standing on the bank, lobbing, lobbing stones at the canoe. Yeah, helps. lovely analogy. Oh, Julia, just thinking that one through for a minute, and you were obviously saying that firms should be looking at their clients and trying to understand their, their, their client's map, if you like, and how the client is approaching its various stakeholders. I mean, how do you start that sort of conversation with a client, do you think? Um, well, you, you do. Um, so, first of all, I think you need to do a little bit of research in that what I was saying about understanding the board agenda or leadership team agenda. So, it's it's relatively easy to do some desk research if, if whichever particular business you're looking at you will see whether they've got a purpose statement that Andrew's talking about um, you'll see whether they're making any strategic changes what their particular priorities are there's an awful lot publicly available so you can get a sense as to where are they at on this I'd also say sectors are really important so there's a lot of differences between industry sectors so get a sense as to where um, different industry sectors are and then have a conversation with them about what you're seeing, what you're hearing, what you're thinking. To, to pick up on Andrew's point about the external side of strategy, what I have found in all the conversations I've had over the last six to nine months with, with leaders, they've gone very internally focused um, and very, very short term focused, understandably. So I think that's that's always a natural tendency within professional services to go internally. So I'd say you've got to really, really keep that external mindset and have these conversations, do a bit of research beforehand, but then have these conversations. They're really welcoming them. Yeah, there's a there's a gentleman that some of you may have come across called A.G. Laffley, who with Roger Martin wrote an amazing book called Playing to Win. And he has this um, observation that when you're looking at the CEO, the E should stand for not executive, but external. In other words, it should be the chief external officer, because if, if the CEO isn't looking outwards at what matters for the business, uh, the business is unlikely to be in a good place. And I, and I think that that's quite a sort of helpful way to start, I think, in strategy is who's actually looking outwards, who's actually, because as you say, the, over the last few months, we've had this uh, uh, probably necessary focus of let's make sure the business runs but it's quite heartening in a way to see the way that marketing going back to the um, results we looked at minutes ago uh, go back six months and the idea that marketing would be have equal prominence to finance in terms of board conversations at professional firms uh, us who have a marketing background would have thought that was a bit of a joke uh, but that actually is where it's at because actually getting new clients in is pretty fundamental to success of the business if you've got a machine that needs to be fed um, so so I think there's that hole there Paloma just go Going back to what you were saying a minute ago around the, the whole sort of training, I mean, to what extent does the training and the programs that you run, I mean, are they are they sector specific or do you find that actually they're as relevant to the leader of a law firm as they are to a leader of say, a retail business? So um, that's that's a really interesting question. And I think one that we we're still grappling with quite a lot. Um, and we've been actually testing some sector specific um, programs specifically actually you'll find this interesting with the hospitality sector because that's actually normally quite a neglected sector in terms of um, training for leadership and management um, versus stuff which is sector agnostic and what we've found is actually businesses from all sectors can really benefit from learning from one another and it comes back to your point about looking externally if you look at a diverse set of external perspectives, you're more likely to learn a lot more. And though it may feel uncomfortable and not as relevant at the outset, once you're kind of in a group of like-minded people, I think Andrew talked to this, you know, having the same set of values, which are very common among business leaders, that actually you can learn from one another a great deal. So our focus is really that our programs are really designed and made available for businesses from all sectors and actually we find that putting diversity in a room is the best is gives delivers the best output 
Yeah, there's, there's a lovely definition I came across, which is that insight is the gap and overlap between silos. Um, Francesca, you're probably more aware of silos than most of us. Do you have any thoughts that you'd like to share on that one? Oh, yeah, yes. Gosh, professional services love a silo, don't they? Um, isn't that the, I, again, if I look back at the last nine, 10 months, isn't that the real thing that we've learned from the pandemic? Is that if you operate in silos and you don't share your knowledge and you don't move forward in a, in a very different way, you, you end up going back to that same old model. And, and actually for a lot of our clients, you can see how they've massively transformed their business not to think so so linear and to be much broader. And it's hard. It's much harder to try and see uh, the big holistic picture, which takes you back to the sustainability question. It's easy to focus on, I don't know, recycling or on one tiny element of it to actually open yourself up to the bigger picture um, is one of the massive challenges of leadership. But also when you're looking at strategy, um, hugely important to not get too locked into to one element. One of the great questions that came in today, should you just look at the work streams and, and see how those operate? And that's a hugely important element but why do you even have those work streams at all? Do they still make sense? Are they where your best opportunities are? Um, what are you trying to achieve through them? And it's kind of getting on the balcony is how I love the way it's often described. You, you stand on the balcony and look at the whole view and then that enables you to work out where to go granular. Uh, but if you don't start off on the balcony, you're, you're, in the, you're foraging around in the undergrowth right from the start and you often miss something important. Yeah, I think that uh, that's a probably a lovely point to end us on, actually. I know we've kind of got a minute to go, but I can see some people are rushing off to their next meeting. So I'd like to take the opportunity, if I may, to uh, thank our amazing panel today. I think it's been a really good start for the new year, and I'm really excited about that. Um, I'd like to uh, thank Julia for her insights on her survey. I think that's been really, really helpful and interesting. Uh, I'd like to thank... Um, Andrew for having given us that feeling that maybe strategy is accessible after all and that yes it isn't something that you read about in a book but you can actually make your own. Paloma for sharing what the amazing work that the charity called uh, Be The Business is achieving and we hopefully will be mentioning some ways that the forum is working with Be The Business shortly. So, so that's exciting. And of course, Francesca, thank you as well for uh, your amazing insights. And as we all said, let's, let's try and break down the silos. So moving forward, what we've got to say is, first of all, as always, the recordings of the shows are going to be available in the management library. So please do um, take advantage of that. And in addition, each of the five minute slots next week will be available as a sort of five minute slot that you can watch uh, in from the, the main website. Uh, hope you found today valuable. It's been a bit of a, as, as Francesca says, we, we actually stopped on the 27th of November. So it's been like five weeks. But in a way, it feels great to be back again. And we've got another exciting um, next week. We've got Sue Venicum from Cranfield talking a bit more about women in leadership role and a guy called Preet Krasantka who's doing some interesting worlds and in things in the tech world. So we're going to try and take you into a, a good place where you really do begin to get a feel for lots of different issues. What was fascinating is when I was doing the... Um, all the five minute slots, uh, there were 67 or 70 keywords that emerged. That gives you a feel for the scope of this program, which is great. So I hope you found it valuable. Please encourage your peers to, block, to come in for future episodes and back next week, what more can I say? So thank you all very much. Thank you to the panel and uh, have a wonderful day and a great weekend when you get there. Bye for now. <laughs>